Uh, so our next presenter now is Andrew Jameson. Andrew has been working in the security embedded systems for over 20 years. Andrew works in the innovation team of Underwriters Laboratories Transaction Security Division. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in information security. His presentation is titled IOT Security. It's in the stars. Please welcome to the stage Andrew Jameson. Hello everybody. I hope you can hear me. I haven't been mic'd up previously. My clicker. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about IoT, obviously a theme for AusCert, Ubiquitous, IoT is everywhere. I'll try not to use too many P's and kind of bounces off the mic. And I'm going to be a little bit controversial in some of the things that I'm saying. Um, I have some controversial views. I'm a controversial sort of guy, but I figured I'd start off with the most controversial question right at the start. Get it out of the way. So, does it make me look fat on this stage? I was expecting a bigger stage. I don't know. But the question then is, how much do you think I weigh? I mean, people weigh different things, but you can objectively make an assessment. Could be wrong. I hope it's wrong if it's high about my weight. How do you do that? How are you able to objectively assess my weight? You can do that because we have units of measurements. We have metrics for weight. And so those metrics are based primarily on this for weight. This is what's called the one kilogram prototype. It is a lump of metal. It's based around various places. You can see them in museums and so forth. Platinum iridium alloy, blah, 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 blah. Ultimately, this is the way we can all say, you think I weigh you know, a svelte 70 kilos, uh, based on the fact that we all know what a kilo is, because we have the metrics to do that. The question then, the question for the audience and the question for this particular topic, how do we measure security? If we're going to have an assessment of security systems, we need to be able to measure it. We need to be able to understand when we say something is secure, what we mean by that, or when we have two different people, two different organizations, two different methodologies of looking at something, we can compare the two and say, well, if this system says it's secure, this other system should do the same thing. Ultimately, we need to define this methodology and we need to have some acceptable level of risk based on this methodology. Now we've got security evaluations already. So how do we do this? How do we do this in the existing methodologies that we have? Well, let's look at those. So here I've got you know, a, a plane and you've got at the top a formalized methodology and coming down the axis there, informal, across the horizontal, individually defined risk and formally or externally defined risk. And if we look at the types of security evaluations that are common today, um, common criteria, FIPS 140, ISO 13491, or um, sorry, yeah, 13491, PTS, penetration testing. I've been involved in all of these, one way or another, usually doing assessments on them. So how do they fit into this plane? Well, common criteria is very formalized. Because of that, it's actually quite expensive and takes an awfully long time. It is very structured. It goes through what's called a certification body, which is generally the information security organization within that government that it's being done in within that country. It takes a very long time, costs a lot of money. I was at a cryptographic module conference just last week in Canada, and everybody was talking about how difficult, time-consuming, and costly security evaluations are because they take this amount of time, they cost this amount of money because they're very formalized. FIPS 140-2, also very formalized. Interestingly enough, the risk is quite individual. They don't really have a lot of metrics in that system, but they do have statements such as it shall be secure, which is great. What exactly does secure mean? ISO 13491 kind of sits in the middle a little bit because you don't really have a lot of metrics in it. You don't have a formalized methodology. There are no testing requirements. PTS, which is a, a system that I use quite often for banking devices, a little bit more formal, 
little bit less costly than common criteria, although to be honest with you, it's kind of merging with common criteria in a large way at the moment, becoming more costly, more time consuming. And then penetration testing varies greatly. Depending on who you're doing it with, depending on what you're testing, you can have some formalized methodologies around this, or alternatively, it can be very subjective and very informal. So these sorts of things then define how the methodology is performed. But then there is the question of the threats. So we talked about methodologies. With threats, from my point of view, I like to think of security problems in three ways. I like to call it security DIY, three types of security problems. They're deliberate problems. These are the back doors that people bake into systems because they want to have access later on. In the best possible light, you could say that people do this because they want to enable features later on, they want to upload code, so forth. Certainly not saying that's a good thing, but often it is so that others can get access maliciously, surreptitiously. Ignorant then, ignorant problems, and these are the majority of the problems that we see, in my opinion, this is where you have poor security settings and configurations. Often it's done through ease of use to make the consumer's life easier, to make the product better, more feature risk, more feature risk, risk? Rich, sorry. <laughs> um, but often, as you add features, as you add functions, as you add new things, you increase the attack surface of the device and you increase potential for security problems. Yet to be discovered. So the why of security DIY, this is where you have problems you don't know about yet. And as we know, security problems in devices, in systems, in software come up all the time. People find new methodologies of attacks, new classifications of attacks, new ways to attack things. And this then requires that you must continually maintain your systems. So how then do we currently address these problems in systems that we have at the moment? So deliberate, code review. If you're gonna find a backdoor, really the only way you're gonna find that is by looking through the code and hunting for it. Sure, you can fuzz it a little bit, but generally code review is gonna be the way that you would find something in there. How do you find the problems of ignorance? Well, code review again, yes, but also penetration testing, fuzzing. You try and find the incorrect, the poor configurations that have been set up. How do we address the why, the yet to be discovered? Well, through prayer. We kinda hope that they don't come up, and then we patch later on. Security evaluations then, in my mind, have three defining features. I talked about the threats, three features of security evaluations. They take time, they cost money, and they always fail. And what I mean by that is they're not a set and forget type of system. You don't do a security evaluation and then walk away saying that product is secure. You do it saying, I've done the best I can within a time and cost budget. I have found a number of vulnerabilities or not, and they've been remediated, hopefully. But at some point in the future, and it could be the second you walk away from that system, a new vulnerability will come up, and that system is no longer secure. So, okay, I've talked a lot about security testing and so forth. How does this fit in with IoT? Well, let's talk about IoT. Devices are becoming smarter. Now, a lot of this is based on the fact that processing elements are becoming smaller, cheaper, less power hungry. When I was devi designing devices back in, I won't mention years, but a long time ago, 8-bit processors used to cost a lot of money. Now, I'm amazed when I do evaluations on products how cheap security processes are. And they're security processes. If you then look at general purpose processes, they are remarkably cheap. And with that, you can enable all sorts of wonderful features and functions and products to do strange and unusual things. As part of these slides, I decided I was going to try and Google the most ridiculous IoT things I could think of. 
So I thought, I know, connected nappies, well, they exist. Um, connected kettles, they exist. Connected cat litter boxes, sure, why not? So you know when your cat's going to do a poo. That's important. Funny thing is, connected toasters, which is often the one that people talk about, actually not so many. This is a, a concept of one there, which I, I quite like it, it prints out the weather. But everything is getting connected because vendors are trying to differentiate their products based on features. So what's the problem with that? I mean, features are great, new things are great. Why is that a security issue? Why can't they just bake in security? We saw in the last presentation one of the questions. Why isn't security just baked in at the start anyway? One of the problems then, the major problem that I see is that as well as trying to differentiate their products based on features, the design, prototype and production cycles are getting compressed. And this reduces the amount of time that the vendors have to test for and remediate vulnerabilities. I see this in the security industry. When I work with people who make products designed specifically with security in mind, they still have end dates. And they say, I've got a go-to-market date on this day. I need to do that. I've had people in the lab coding up new releases of code as we found problems with it every day so that they can hit their go-to-market date. Now, if that's a problem for people who are making security devices, it's an even bigger problem for people who are making commercial devices where they're intending to sell millions of products and therefore their margins are razor thin and every day they're not on the market, they're losing money. The other problem, customers can't necessarily differentiate products based on security. Sure, everybody kind of talks about security and says it's important and, you know, we need to be concerned about it, but I'm not completely convinced that when it comes to actually paying for it, everybody would do that. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. New vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, released all the time. The final point is the product vendors, the people who are making these products, there is no incentive for them to make more secure systems. Sure, we'd like it. Sure, it'd be great. At the end of the day, we live in mostly a capitalist world. They want to make money. And so if they're going to spend extra time and extra production budget or development budget into their products to make security, there needs to be some incentive. Otherwise, why would they do it? They're interested in differentiating their products based on functionality and cost. At the moment, they can't necessarily differentiate their product on security. And that's in development. Once it's released, why would they patch it? They're making device money. They sell once, they make their money, no incentive to patch. So why isn't it fixed already? Been around for a long time. We've talked about security. Security is important. OK, so why don't we just do pen testing code review on these systems? Well, cost time issues. Once again, time budget, cost budget, I just personally don't think it's going to work to the extent that we need to. Why? Well, it doesn't scale. Gartner article here talks about, you know, 25 billion things connected to the internet. That's a lot of pen testers. We already have issues at the moment where there's not enough security people in the industry to service the existing need. If we're going to pen test every product before it's released, not only is there a time and cost issue, there's an issue around how many people are going to be available to do that. Pen testing is a point in time solution. Once again, we need to maintain these products over time. It doesn't address ongoing security. Security evaluations are inherently subjective. You're going to choose the gold dress pen tester or the blue dress pen tester. Because, as I mentioned at the start, it's a subjective evaluation. There's no formalized methodology, or at least if there is, and there is in some contexts, it's not well maintained. And as somebody who manages a number of security labs around the world for one company, I can tell you it's hard to maintain parity within the same organization, let alone when you're dealing with tens or hundreds of different organizations that do different things, have different incentives, monetize things differently. Finally, the cost of this isn't exposed to the customer. 
and the value of it isn't exposed to the customer. So what I mean by that? Let's say you go into a store, there's two televisions. They have the same features, same resolution, same smart features. You know, as far as you can tell, the picture is exactly the same. It's going to mount on the wall the same way. It's going to look perfect in your house. This is the television you want. There's two of them. One costs 500 bucks. One costs 750 bucks. Now, without any additional information, because there's no information that you can get from this in terms of security, which one are you going to choose? But what if one was more secure? Would you care? How would you know that it's more secure? And how much would you care? Are you going to care $250 worth? There's certainly going to be a point at which you're going to care less. But security takes time and costs money. So that cost needs to be exposed. This means that IoT security, in my opinion, is a commercial problem. Sure, it's a technical problem. But that technical problem is because there are no correct commercials wrapped around the ability to externalize the development cost and the ongoing cost of security. There is no incentive for vendors to maintain security over time. So what is the solution then? How are we going to fix this? Well, commercial problems need to be addressed commercially. Kind of makes sense. We need to create an incentive for the vendor to build security into their products. We need to be able to inform customers so they can make a purchase decision. So when a product costs more because it is more secure, they can decide whether they want more security at more cost or less security and just take a little bit more money home. We need to also provide methods for the vendors to understand security. Now, security is hard, it's a bit of a cliche, but ultimately, a lot of these people are very good at making products, very good at adding features, but they don't always understand why or when that causes problems in security. Once again, work a lot with device vendors for the security industry. Even in that context, they don't always understand why something is more or less secure. And so if we're going to make products more secure, we need to help educate the vendors, because otherwise it's not going to happen. And we need to do all of this within a framework that allows for rapid development because products need to go to market on their go to market date. We need to do it in as little time and cost as possible because things have budgets and with as little overhead as possible. Sounds easy. Well, whenever I'm faced with an insurmountable problem, I always refer to the oracle that is Battlestar Galactica. All of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. And look to the stars for salvation. Star rating programs, nice segue there, have been used to change consumer behavior in the past. So we've got star ratings for energy to help change consumer behavior around energy consumption. Do they want the more energy efficient product that is going to cost more money? Or do they want to spend less money now and have a less energy efficient product? And this system is used around the world. This is the EU rating for that sort of thing. We also have star ratings for water consumption. Now, my personal anecdote around this is I was purchasing a, um, a dishwasher at one point. We went in. I saw the one that was cheaper. I said, wow, I really like this one. My wife saw the one that had five water star rating, said, I really like that one, because she had been incentivized around environmental issues and so forth to buy something that had a higher star rating. Now, when you looked at it, the difference wasn't actually that much. The star rating, though, was changing the purchase behavior at the point of purchase. You have star ratings for cars as well for safety in cars. Why don't we have this for security? Well, there are problems. How are we going to compare devices in terms of evaluating their security? You could be comparing a router to a smart light bulb. How are we going to do that? You could be looking at something that's written in Visual C Sharp or C++ or Java. How are we going to compare across those platforms? The operating system could be different. How are we going to compare between systems objectively so that when you have something that's running embedded Windows against something that's running Linux, how do you compare them? 
How are we going to assess them? How are we going to do that in a cost-effective way? Well, let's keep it simple. I always like to try and keep things simple whenever we can. As far as I'm concerned, devices, any device, any computing system can be defined by three simple things. Interfaces. It will have inputs and outputs. If it doesn't have an input or an output, it's a brick. If it only has inputs, it's a heater. They have to have inputs and outputs to be a computing system. Processing attack surface. So this is the code that makes the product do whatever it does. Everything has code in. One of my pet hates is when people talk about hardware-only systems. Everything has code in. And that has some sort of attack surface based on what it's written in, how big it is, how many functions it has. Then you have the system architecture. What does it run on? Is it Harvard architecture? Is it von Neumann architecture? Does it have memory protection? Is it all being run directly out of ROM? Does it have relocatable memory? These sorts of things are interesting when it comes to how a device can be attacked. I'm going to call the combination of those things the vulnerability surface. So the more interfaces, the larger the attack surface, and the less secure a system can be objectively considered. The architecture then can help make the system more secure or less secure by changing the vulnerability surface, changing your ability to exploit features or vulnerabilities in the attack surface. So what we need to do then, once we've got these ways of assessing a system, we need to address the metrics. We need to wrap metrics around that. How are we going to do that? How are we going to define the metrics? Well, this is where we can go back in history and we can figure out what they did. They just made them up. The kilogram isn't a specific physical thing. It's something people made up so you could compare weights. So we can make up metrics to enable us to compare the security of systems. So I'm going to call this the logical security posture, or LSP, based on a point system. And you have points assigned for security features, and you deduct points for increasing attack surface, incorrect configurations, um, poor architectures, these sorts of things. And you can do this because most computing vulnerabilities have similar root causes. Lack of randomness, big one, happens all the time. Default configurations, passwords, cryptographic keys, happens all the time. Overprivileged and vulnerable code. Insecure updates, communication methods, little or no logical protections. These are the sorts of things I see in products all the time. And so we can wrap some metrics around that. So let's look at interfaces then. Every interface is doing you damage. Each protocol supported increases the attack surface of the system. And if you run that code a lesser privilege, um, you can reduce the vulnerability surface. Sure, most people don't do that. So you can exploit the vulnerable code for a meaningful option. So in LSP, we assign negative points for all of the logical interfaces. They run at the same privilege as the assets, and the assets could be personal information, it could be cryptographic keys, it could be anything. Then you apply a multiplication factor because it's more vulnerable. You're increasing the vulnerability surface. Factors reducing the vulnerability surface, maybe it's being run in a TE, these sorts of things, um, add points or decrease the multiplier. Now, this gives the vendor clear guidance that more interfaces is bad. Now, it sounds obvious, but it's just amazing. The vendors are trying to differentiate their products based on features. Features require more protocols, more code, so forth. If you make it clear to the vendors that that's a bad thing for security, and that could affect their sales later on, that helps the vendors make sensible decisions. So why do we need yet another attack rating method? We've already got Jill, um, which is a, a methodology that's contained in common criteria. We've got CVSS. Why don't we just use those? Well, they're for actual vulnerabilities. What I'm talking here is not costing a vulnerability. It's a theoretical concept about the security of a system. If the system has a vulnerability, it should be patched. It should be fixed. Now, that's where pen testing and code review comes in. LSP helps to inform the vendors about security, as I mentioned. 
provide clear incentives, and the costings require, if you're going to use Jill, if you're going to use CVSS, you need to do the pen testing, you need to do the code review. That takes time, costs money. I'm not sure that's going to work in IoT. I just don't see how it scales. I don't see how the vendors have enough time. I don't see the consumers being willing to pay for that. So let's look at an example. So if we look at two Linux-based systems, basically the same. I'm going to call them routed and routy, routy McRoutface. Um, these have certain features and functions, um, greatly simplified, obviously. I don't have enough space on these slides to include all features and functions, but they do certain things. They've got various interfaces and so forth. So if we take a closer look at routed, well, okay, we can start off saying there are vulnerabilities. They're easy to see. It's got an old Linux kernel, it's got multiple vulnerabilities, it's got an old OpenSSL ver version, it's got multiple vulnerabilities, it's not a very fair comparison. So let's assume that they're fixed. And now we have exactly the same systems, running exactly the same code, but it has different vulnerability surface. So external interfaces exposed at root, that's a problem. That causes increased vulnerability surface, so minus points. Default passwords, problem, minus points. Default certs, problem, minus points. And they may not even necessarily be default, just generated the same each time. And because they don't have a, um, a non-stateful random number system, so ultimately, if you start up that router system, whatever it is, you start that up, the same cert will be generated at the same time each time. They did a, uh, a scan essentially of the internet a number of years ago and found that of all the systems that you could access, routers, firewalls, so forth, on the internet, 3% of them had the same certificates. They weren't default, they were being generated randomly the same way because the random number generators weren't being used properly. Non-secure interface, exposed, minus points, you get the idea. No commitment to updates. An important part of this is you must patch because we have to assume that new security vulnerabilities will come out. So you absolutely have to patch your system. You have no commitment. You do not get to have a good score. So what does this mean? What it would look like? Ultimately, no patching, zero stars, an automatic fail. The other one, not too bad. It's got some good features. It, they're running things at different privilege levels. They're using the right random number generator. They have a unique um, password and username that's on the sticker, so that you can always turn it over. But if you don't have physical access, you don't know it. These are good things. And importantly, there is a date limit on it, because they have said that they would patch it for a certain number of years, certain period of time, so the star rating is fixed for that time. It's not forever, it is only until it stops being patched, at which point it is considered insecure. So is Routy more secure than Routed? Well, yes. It has better configurations, it has better implementations, it has a smaller vulnerability surface, even though they both do the same thing. Does this mean Routy is secure? No, it'll still need patching. And if they don't do that, then they need to lose their star points, not only on this system, they need to lose it into the future as well on other systems. They've demonstrated they're not meeting their commitments, they lose points and star rating into the future. So does this mean that the less secure system, routed, will be exposed and vulnerable first? Not necessarily. More secure doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't fail. What we're not saying here is the system is secure. We're not talking binary. We're not saying secure and insecure. We're saying this configuration is better because ultimately that's really the only thing we can do within the time cost constraints that we have. That's why we have patching though. How do we ensure patching? How do we make sure that the vendors are meeting their commitments, are patching their systems, are doing what they say they do and they're not just going, oh yeah, I'll patch it for three years, but then they ship it and nothing ever happens. Well, once again, this has all happened before and will happen again. So, I'm from an organization called UL. UL does a lot of 
electrical safety testing. Has done for 100 years, but it's not unique in this. Lots of organizations do this. I'm not here to talk about UL at all, really. But the interesting part of this, they had a similar problem. When they're looking at electrical safety, how do they know when you test the electrical safety of a speaker, for example, that they don't just ship you a perfect speaker and then they manufacture something in the factory that is cheaper but completely unsafe? There is a system called a follow-up service. Every product that has a UL mark on it, there are six billion products in the world that have UL marks on it. Every single product that has that mark, somebody goes to the factory where that product is created every quarter and make sure it's still being made the same way. This already happens. So we can do that for security as well. We can make sure that when a vendor says, I'm going to patch this, somebody goes in and checks it. They don't necessarily have to redo a pen test or anything like that. It's just go in and say, OK, so I see you know, you've got this particular Linux kernel version or something like that. It needs patching. Show me your latest patch. If they haven't done it, they lose their stars can be done, can be done simply, can be done cheaply, fits in the time cost budget. So if they don't do it, then they lose their points. That's the important thing. So ultimately, IoT security. The problems are consumers aren't security engineers. They can't differentiate products based on security. And to be honest with you, even those of us who can, still make decisions based on features and functions and cost. For example, I assume we're all security people in this room, and I don't want people to put up their hands, but I equally assume a number of people in this audience have phones that are produced by you know, Android manufacturers, Samsung, Huawei, I'm not going to pick on a particular manufacturer, that aren't really patched. Because you've made a decision on the phone that you're buying based on cost and based on features. Personally, I only use Nexus phones. I'm a big Android fan, but also I'm a big fan of patching, and I make sure that the phone I have is patched every month with security updates. So even security people don't necessarily make decisions around security all the time. Features, functions, cost is important. Security is hard, that is true, but because it's hard, it is a costly and time-consuming endeavor, and that is the problem. It's not that it's hard. Being hard is simply the thing that makes the problem. And the problem is you can't fit security into easily into the development cost of a product. Commercial problems need commercial solutions. Insurance is a great market driver. Um, I think insurance is going to be something that changes things over time. I want to be very clear when I'm talking here, actually, that I'm talking about consumer products to a large extent. I think when we talk about industrial products, healthcare products, they need to be tested more thoroughly. They have a better time and cost budget in which to absorb the cost of security. I'm talking about consumer security, but I think insurance can still play a part in this, but they need metrics. The insurance industry needs to know that they're not just throwing money away when they're insuring somebody, so they need to be able to assess whether something's secure or not. Now, markets also don't respond well to step functions. What I mean by that is if you say tomorrow every product shipped must be secure, it's not going to happen. It takes, for example, the payment industry, it's taken them, oh, let's see, about 15 years to change from DES to triple DES. And <laughs> to be honest with you, some people still use single DES. It takes a while to build security into systems, into products, to educate people so we need to make sure that we have metrics to drive the commercial responsibility into the vendors. And in fact, we need to encourage the vendors to build more secure systems and maintain them over time. I would suggest if we're going to have a five-star rated system and some product has five stars, they need to have a bug bounty on that product. They need to be committed to the security of that product so that people are actively looking for vulnerabilities in it, and they're going to patch because they've committed to patch. So ultimately, IoT security. Personally, I think it's in the stars. Not necessarily these stars, though. These stars. Thank you very much.
<laughs> okay, so do we need to wait for a large... I have to read them out. I think this whole silent question thing is really weird. And do we... <laughs> Do we need to wait for a large breach for companies to pay attention? <sighs> Probably. Um, although I would go so further as to say I don't think a large breach will be enough. I think there needs to be uh, buy-in from governments and consumers on this. I think it'll take time. We're going to need something big, yes. Um, my concern is if we don't do something soon, it's going to be a little bit too late. So I think we need to build it in now. But yeah, we probably need a breach. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know of any. Um, there, there might be some in the car industry. Um, but in terms of consumer products, I personally don't know of any. I don't know whether anybody in the audience does, but I don't know of any. Oh, the baby monitors, yes. Yep. Yeah, and there was VTech as well, um, which had some issues. So, yeah, okay, that's a good point. I, I think regulations are good. Um, I, I mean, ultimately, if anything's going to happen, it needs to happen one of two ways. You either need to legislate it, and you need some either an industry body to step in and say these are the rules, which is probably not going to happen, or a government to step in and say these are the rules, which could happen. Or you need to try and drive it commercially, as I'm saying, through something like star ratings and let basically the commercials sort themselves out. I think there probably is a place for regulation, but as I said, the problem is that if you just regulated today and said everything must be secure tomorrow, it just wouldn't work. You just can't do that. The vendors don't know what they're doing, and there's not enough people to test all of the products. So yes, I think we need regulation, but that needs to be built around a testable framework. Okay, I, I, I violated my whole rule of reading it out, so I'm going to read out. Um, would making vendors liable in the legal sense for security issues and the products make a difference? Um, it, it would. It absolutely would. Uh, I think we've seen a change in the way companies take security seriously in terms of when um, uh, board members have been held liable. That really changes the way the company you know, behaves to a large extent. So I think making vendors liable would. But... The question is then liable for what? I mean, what exactly are we going to make them liable for? Is it loss of information? Is it just vulnerabilities in their product? Um, some companies won't care as much. How do you make a vendor in China liable for a fraud that happens in Australia? I think there's a lot of complexity around it. It would help, but I'm not really sure how you do it. I, I think, yes, is the answer. I think they would. Um, so I was at a meeting in, where was it, Sweden at the start of the year, talking to a large vendor of um, uh, consumer products. I won't mention any specific names. But they were very interested in having their devices tested for security in some way. I think, and they were very interested in exposing that. Certainly if they're going to do it, if they're going to put in the hard yards, they absolutely want to expose that. They don't want to do something and then increase the cost of their product without being able to tell everybody why it's costing more. So I think there is definitely a, um, an appetite for this in some areas, and certainly there is not an appetite in other areas, but I think once you have some companies doing it, it will drive others to follow because I think consumers will choose it. I, I personally don't think it will um, confuse consumers um, if it's done right but maybe I'm just, uh, I'm not the average consumer, so I don't know. But I don't think it's confusing. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I've tried to build that into this system, certainly in terms of patching. However, I think you can at least make a go at assessing the security of the system. Um, I think just saying, you know what, I'm not even going to look at it, you just have to patch, is fine, but it's very reactive. I think 
you need to be reactive, but I think also we need to have methodologies to assess them, and I think it can be done. Um, I think it can be done. So I agree, yes, should be patched, should be all these sorts of things, but I think we can build the methodology in for assessment at the same time. And apparently that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>